So uh, I guess what we can do is I would like to introduce you, but I'm I'm unsure on how to say your last name properly. <laughs> okay, that's fine. It's Avanant. Avanant. So. Yep. If you're the Americans like say Avanant, but it's Avanant is the, the proper A Avanant. So you, yeah, look, if you say I'm a Willem Avanant, that that'll fly as well. You know, it's, I've yeah. gotten to the point where I've got so many identities; it doesn't really matter as long as you know who I am. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, the the face in front of the screen. Um, so uh, I would like to in introduce you guys to who I am speaking with. Mm -hmm. uh, this is William or William Willem. Avenant. Willem. Mm -hmm. Willem yep. Avenant. And uh, the reason he is with me today is because he is the closest I've ever come to speaking with an expert in rally and rally racing. So I'm incredibly excited that you're here because I have daydreamed about rally as a young boy riding dirt bikes. And mm -hmm. back then in the 80s and the 90s, you would it's very difficult to find any media on Dakar because it wasn't a mainstream thing. But uh, why don't you go ahead and tell me a little bit about your background? I know you've been a race director. You're heavily involved. But give me the, 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 the Coles notes, the summarized mm -hmm. version of how you ended up to be where you are. Yeah, great, man. Well, um, the, the, the nice to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, really honored and humbled to be with you guys today. Um, you know, in short, the short answer is the, exactly the same answer as you. Is the, the reason I came to be here today was simply because of daydreaming about Dakar in the old days, you know, in the, in the days of the 950s and the big V-twins and the desert, you know. So I pretty much... For us in South Africa, the Dakar is like a, quite a big thing. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's like, it's not a national craze, but it's pretty big. And um, at the beginning of every year, that kind of, it marked the year that, you know, 1st of January, Dakar starts. And there was always, there were always quite a few South Africans in there that did well, still is today. And um, it was, I remember for me, the big thing is I was always allowed to stay up late to watch it uh, with my dad. And that was one big thing because, you know, the rest of the time is, oh, it's bedtime. You have to go to bed. And the two weeks of Dakar didn't matter. Like, you know, the, you could watch Dakar and then you could go to bed. So pretty much that was the daydream. And, you know, I've spent my whole life um, wanting to do it. I've always been around bikes. You know, I started on a, Honda Express 50, you know, three gear automatic yellow bike that used to be my dad's that I still believe is one of the hardest bikes in the world. You know, we still haven't broken that thing. I only when I was a teenager, I learned that you had to mix two stroke. I still don't know how that thing can rode like without two stroke. But anyway, so, you know, and I kind of went up the ranks at DT50 and never a professional racer, just a super like passionate bike guy you know so dt50 it 175 uh, xl 250 and every time you got that bike you know it was just a new world opened up it was never like oh this is a bike and also for well, where we live you know these were old bikes and they were all X farm bikes and i don't know if it's the same in the u.s but in south africa farmers are notoriously bad at maintenance <laughs> so you know <clears throat> the bike that you end up buying is already falling apart and um for me it was one of those things where i would save i would i mean i had businesses at school i used to sell horses to buy bikes you know that was like my thing um so I always had bikes and then um, I left South Africa. I worked abroad um, and I had this dream of like dry, riding through Africa. Uh, but because of the daydream, you know, on a big twin, you know, so I, my thing was a Africa twin 750. That was, that was my bike, you know, it was my dream. Um, so I worked in England for a while and um, came back, went back to South Africa and managed to buy myself an Africa 2750, a 1998 model. Um, I got on that bike 
and I got off 8,000 Ks later. I just, and I had no experience of big bike riding, anything like that. I mean, the stuff I did now, it was just like ignorance was bliss. I was actually fairly stupid, but you don't know it at the time, right? Like, you know, I never knew how to change a, a flat. You know, I just rode the bike. <laughs> Luckily, I never had flats. So that was like a lot of ignorance, but I did like 8,000 Ks on the bike, you know, and I just loved it. Um, and then a few things happened and I, I never did the whole Africa thing. And I met my wife, I got married, I was in Alaska, I went back to South Africa and eventually one day I was just like, listen, you know, this dream will only stay a dream unless you start acting on it. Like there's no way that, that, that that's what makes the difference so i started saving and i bought myself my first rally bike which is a converted 450 um 2012 model still one of my most favorite bikes uh, xe exc 450 uh, i just spent two weeks on it it has 650 hours on the clock you know um and it still keeps on it's still going so the first step was buy the bike uh, second step was do your first rally, which was a intense baptism of fire. You know, I my fingernails fell off afterwards. I, I it was just it was one of the toughest, hardest things I've ever done, and I was hooked. Yeah, I was like totally hooked. But at the same time, I was like, man, this shouldn't be this difficult. Like, if I had only known half the stuff that I know after the race, it would have been so much better. So I kind of set off on this mission to make and understand or make rally more understandable to people and to learn from not just my mistakes, but other people's mistakes and say like, okay, how can I save somebody that wants to get into the sport five years or three years? And what I discovered was this amazing, amazing community. Like there is no cooler community than the rally community because everybody has each other's backs everybody wants to share knowledge it's almost like open source for motorbikes you know it's pretty it's pretty cool but you have to kind of punch through the layer and get into the community um and so that became kind of my focus so even though i had fairly little experience i was like okay i'm gonna gain experience through other people's experiences and obviously by myself by doing these things um and that it created a scenario where i could fast forward my rally career because of other people's experience so you know what would normally take i would say five years to achieve i probably managed to do in three because of other people's help and because of also the way that i approached it i approached it very very systematic um and now i've kind of reached the point where you know i i do everything in the rally world so i i facilitate roadbook camps where we try and expose people to what it's like to ride a roadbook um i'm very careful to to make sure that i'm not saying that i'm a trainer i can't train you how to ride a bike but I can expose you and teach you how to navigate, which is kind of my strong point. Um, and to me, that's the first step because that's what gets you hooked. So whether you have an adventure bike, whether you have a dirt bike, the key is just to start and experience it. And the rest comes then by itself. So I do that. Um, I do race directing and route building for various rallies around the world. Um, in the US, I'm the race director for the Baja Rally, which this year is going to be a blowout race so very very excited about that um and then i also built digital tablets or digital roadbooks for people so if you don't want to spend all the money on the traditional roadbook setup or if you don't know whether you like rally uh we we, we try and make it more accessible by having an android tablet that you use for everything that you would need so it's like an all-in-one navigation device so that's it. Sorry, I know that you asked for something short, but that's as short as I can make it. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 fascinated about these the idea of a rally, and I am, although I was a you know incredibly casual fan, uh, as a you know it captured my imagination for adventure mm -hmm. and motorcycles, of course. Um, but I don't know that much about rally itself, and one of the questions I had for you is. 
is a rally a rally a rally? Like, what is a rally? And then are there different mm-hmm. types of rallies? Because there's all kinds mm-hmm. of different enduros and hair scrambles. Mm-hmm. And so so tell me a bit about what, what's a rally traditionally, I guess. And then maybe what, okay. what are yeah. the rallies that you know about? Okay, cool. So I think one of the most interesting things for me is that I've learned that each – oh, let's start with defining a rally. So to me, a cross-country rally – would be a multi-day event where you have to navigate from point A to point B, given a set of instructions, which we call a roadbook, and where there is no prior knowledge of the course to the competitor. Um, That is, I think, in its barest bones forms what it is. Um, the terminology has started shifting towards rally raid uh, to create that uh, difference between a road rally and an off-road rally and WTRC or Sturgis uh, in Le- or whatever, you know, like everybody's like, oh, you're a biker, like, you know, then they look at you and it's like, no, no, I'm a rally rider. <laughs> and it becomes a whole discussion. So I think in short, that's how I would put it is multi-day event where you have to navigate where there is no mark course um and given the nature of it uh definitely each rally has got a unique uh personality almost it's it's something that's alive and 90 percent of the time that personality gets brought on by the organizer um and that feel for it gets brought on by the organizer um so you know in the us it's a it's a sport that's growing incredibly fast because of the fact that it brings everything together it brings together adventure it brings together tenacity um you know just grit you know to do a rally you have to have grit to finish a rally let's put it that way um and i find that it attracts very specific personality types you know because you have to be a abc type of person in order to tick all the boxes and dot all the i's and cross all the t's in order to be successful you might just decide okay i'm gonna go for it and sometimes that pays off um so for me you know it's (laughs) the, the 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 kind of core of a rally for me is the fact that you know we put ourselves under tremendous strain and stress um and in that moment it's probably never easy you know i have this thing where we're all fighting a battle in the rally i mean i can tell you so many stories of each guy and you're kind of fighting for survival but then in the end when you finish that amount of satisfaction or that feeling of satisfaction that you that you experience is something that is akin to a drug you know it's all i can it's 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 a it's just such a rush and it's so weird because half the time where it rarely finishes even dakar it finishes in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody that watches you you know there's not thousands of people shouting your name or anything like that it's like oh handshake well done there you go you finished and you're like wait a minute like i just spent eight days or five days in the desert like where's my recognition and i think that's a big part of it is it is a deeply personal sport but everybody shares this bond um i always equate it to each you can go to people that did a rally in 1995 if you did a rally with other people even if you never spoke to them you have an unspoken bond and you would you know i can phone somebody and say hey like you know remember me i was at that that race and that guy will go to the ends of the earth to help you just because you shared that experience um so that's kind of to me what what rally is and how i would describe it to somebody that's not done it um another thing that people miss understanding of it is, is you know we all see this money shot of the bike jumping over the dune or a bike going 160 kilometers an hour. Those things are what I call rally gold. Those are the moments that you live for in a race. But to put it in a perspective, I mean, Dakar is is an exception, but most rallies, your average speed is between 40 and 50 Ks an hour over 
five to six days. That that's that's the data. That's the reality. And it because you navigate, you know, it's very rare that you can go flat out for long periods of time. Dakar and a few other rallies allows that because of the terrain and that's why you pay so much money because you go and play in the big sandbox but most of the time a rally is way more technical and organizers are pushing that technicality more and more every year because we want to get the speeds down um, we realize that you know even if we cap bikes at four uh, at 250 the manufacturer will still get it to go 160. So I think we're moving away from the idea of capping the bikes. And in many races around the world, big bikes are coming back. You know, the big bikes are starting to make a comeback, which I like. Uh, I'm a big fan of that um, because they want to go back to the days of old. And they're like, you know, let's change the terrain rather than the bike. And if you want to come and struggle on a big twin, be my guest. Uh, but at least you're not going to kill yourself. Um, so the navigation aspect of that, that is the big, big part of it. And that is why you sit with much lower speeds than what people think. You know, if somebody meets you and they've seen their car and they've talked about it, they're like, oh, you're the guys that go fast in the desert. I'm like, we're the guys that want to go fast in the desert. That's our, that's where we want to be. But it's not very often that you get a stretch of 50 Ks where you can ride 120 in one go, unless you're in that car. But normal rallies within the United States or Mexico or Canada, you know, you're always going to have speed zones. I mean, that's another very interesting fact about about rally, right? It's it's all about time management and then penalties. You can even look at the standings of this year's Dakar. The races get won, won and lost on penalties. So speed zones is a huge part of rallies. And if you have a... a, a Organizers are extremely strict on it because of land access and people complaining and safety. So if you have a speed infringement, you know, if you go one kilometer over the speed zone, you immediately get a penalty. There's no, it's immediate. It's like zap. And that penalty can cost you the race. You know, if you look at uh, Dakar this year, uh, Ross Brands and Ricky Brayback, at, at points were one second apart. Um, and in rallies, in, in normal rallies, that's not that car, you have a ton of speed zones because you go through villages, you go through housing areas, you go through uh, sensitive environmental areas where the organizer will put a speed zone on. Um, in the U.S., there's uh, the Kota rally out in Colorado and um, Utah where the whole rally is on the speed zone and the mental effort it takes to stick to a speed and not go over it is insane. Um, so that's something else that makes rally different is that constant, constant concentration. You know, you, it's not just riding your bike, it's planning, thinking ahead all the time and also planning your next moves, you know, and then you get, I, I made a stupid mistake. I, I think it was at Sonora where we were um, in a rally, uh, in a speed zone and there was a cow in the road, so I slowed down. I don't have to worry because I'm in the speed zone. And for a split second, I was thinking about the cow and not the speed zone. So as I pulled away from the cow, I went over the speed limit and I got slammed with a massive penalty just because for that two seconds, I wasn't concentrating on the speed zone. Um, so that's how, how intense it is, basically. I hope that answers the question. Sorry, I can I can ramble on all day about it. <laughs> you you mentioned earlier about um, about growing the sport and how in the Western world, or at least in North America, rally is trying to grow, and a lot of people don't they're aware of rally, but they're not really aware of rally. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, all these different communities and pockets of motorcyclists you know, from adventure riders to dual sport riders to enduro racers, motocross guys, where, where are the people coming from that have an interest in rally? Like, is there a, is there a pattern that you're seeing that like say adventure mm -hmm. riders really like rally or is it dual sport guys or is it enduro guys? Like where okay. do they come from and why? Um, I think, so this is my observation in North America, right? There's, there's different places in the world, but um, in North America, the the biggest growth that I'm seeing is from people of 
I, I, I'm guessing if I say our generation, that would probably be all right. That is people that have always wanted to do it and they grew up with this mystique of their car and, and they now want to, they get to a point in life where they can try it out. They want to try it. So, you know, even a Dakar, if you look at the average age of people, you know, most people are past 45 because it is an expensive sport. It is hard to get into, which is a big reason why I'm pushing accessibility more because we want to get more young people in the sport. Um, so number one would be people in the age group from, let's say, 45 to 60 that has time and that has the means to get into the sport because they've always wanted to try it. That's number one. Number two would be anybody that has reached a fairly high level within their discipline. So if you are, I, I unfortunately don't know a lot about supercross and motocross, but if you have gotten to a, or if you've reached a certain point in your career as a professional racer, the pinnacle of motorcycle racing is Dakar and the rally racing. So what happens more often than not is that you go through the, the ringer either on the motocross track or in the enduro track, and then eventually you start rubbing shoulders with somebody that's like, oh, well, you're so good at this. Have you tried rally? Um, and that's a, but that's a very small steady flow. And, and it's also the elite guys, right? That's not people, normal guys that, that's on bikes. Um, so that's the two kind of streams of people that's currently coming into the sport. Um, I personally would love to bring adventure riders more into it for the simple reason that to me, all, all the roadbook riding is, we don't even have to call it a rally, we can just call it roadbook riding, is adventure riding on steroids because it gives you a reason to ride your bike. You know, uh, nobody wants to follow a GPX line. And in fact, it's actually way more dangerous because you can't, you don't know what's coming up. Whereas with a road book, it breaks out the route in segments and it will give you warnings of stuff. So it's not always a racing. It's more about the fun of experiencing a new place on a road. Book. So there are more and more adventure riders that slowly getting into the sport for the challenge of doing it with a bigger bike. Uh, a great example is I have a friend called um, Brett Fox. He's on a uh, Kate, um, Tiger 900. Uh, we had two guys that came to Baja Rally last year that rode their bikes up from the Darien Gap all the way to um, to um, uh uh, Catavina, and they competed one on HP2 and one on a T7. So we're definitely getting an influx of hardcore adventure riders. I know um, uh, the guys from XL ADV did it a few years ago on a 990, where it becomes a challenge of can I go with a big bike in difficult terrain? Um, it is a bit of a you have more fun on a smaller bike in a rally. Rallies are designed to, for smaller bikes, but I have also done a lot of work in developing routes that are adventure bike friendly, just so that you can experience the road. Um, but the segment mainly will be older guys that has always dreamt about it, and then younger guys that are absolute pros at what they do, and they want to take the next step. Um, right. Currently, I, I want to reach a wider audience of people that say, okay, how can I make my riding more fun and how can I enjoy it more? So so uh, for someone who may be listening that's in that demographic, you know, they're interested in rally, they're rally curious, they're, mm -hmm. they're 40 to 60, they may or may not have the means to do it. What what would be the the wrong way to go about this? And what would be the correct way to go about this? <laughs> That's uh, like, I wonder if there is a wrong way. I'm, I'm so passionate about it. It's like, you know, just do it. But I think for me, the worst thing that you can probably do is just dive in head first because I've seen so many people 
you know, they see it, they get an idea in their head and they want to do it. And then they don't have a good experience. And, you know, for me that it's heartbreaking because I'm like, you know, it didn't need to be that way. But, you know, the worst thing I want is for somebody to, you know, rent a bike, buy a bike, you know, travel internationally, go to an event and then find out within the first stage that, man, I don't belong here, <laughs> you know, and that, that has happened. It happens a lot. So I would, I guess that's the wrong way to go about it. Um, you get people that stuff enough, right? I, I mean, I've seen people that just show up at Dakar and has no experience and they succeed. So it is a lot of it is down to personality and your ability to cope with adverse scenarios, but something like advanced navigation or knowing how to work on your bike, right? That, that stuff that, out in the middle of nowhere, you you kind of have to have the basics. So because of that, I actually have now done a lot of work to create scenarios where people can experience rally racing without having to go to a race. Um, and I've created quite a few events like that actually all around the world where we say, okay, come experience it and then see if it's for you so i would say the best way to do it is a staged approach and say okay let me try it out in whichever way shape or form um in the us and and i'm assuming we're talking to the us market yeah or, or north american market um there are amazing opportunities to do exactly that um, a friend of mine, Dan Bart, is running a event called the SoCal Rally. Um, and that's another thing. Sorry, I digress. But, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of underground, like, you know, because people don't want to make a lot of noise about it. So the SoCal Rally is a great opportunity because it's not a formal event. It's a scenario of here's the coordinates. You show up in the desert with your bike and your road book. And you're, you get to ride roadbooks for four days at your own pace, at your own speed. And it's, and you kind of learn through others, um, how it works. Um, so there's a, quite a few of those informal events around. Um, there's a guy on the East Coast called Todd Zacker that runs Zacker Adventures. He does roadbook riding mainly on ADV bikes to teach people the basics. Um, Baja Rally does a rally school in May, which is like, come and do the school. If you like the school, you're going to love the rally. Um, and then myself, I've partnered with quite a few people. Um, so we have in Colorado in May, we do something with the school of moto up there where we do rally school for dirt bikes. So if you're a dirt biker, and you want to experience what it's like, um, then we've got two events up there that you, you know you just kind of you. It's low stakes. You get to ride your your dirt bike in an amazing environment of Colorado, but you get to learn how to navigate. And it's like that's the not the area out there just blows my mind every time I go out there. Um, in Canada, we have partnered with True, is it True North Moto. Um, I'm sorry, Ride North Moto, Mike Haberoth and those guys that do the ice road stuff. Um, we have the Boreal Royale at the end of June where you can come and just do a, the ride like they do every year, or you can do the roadbook ride and just experience it. Um, and then in September out in South Dakota, we've got the high Sega, um, the rally camp. So the high Sega lodge puts up a, a ride and we put the ride on, uh, road books and you can basically ride the ride with the road book and see if you like it. Um, so that, and that's just in North America, right? There's tons of, of other stuff that we do all over. So North America has got some of the best learning the cheapest best learning opportunities if you ever want to get into the sport yeah it seems like uh there's a tremendous amount of opportunities to to dip your toe in and try it mm -hmm. and see if you like it and i mm -hmm. do agree with you it feels like it's very underground like mm -hmm. you need to pursue it proactively pursue the information rather than it just being available 
um, yes. commonly. And that's a big thing that I'm, I'm trying to change. It, it's just, and, and guys like yourself help with that because, you know, it's your alone voice in the wilderness, right? So how, how, to get the message out often, I mean, especially today on, on social media and stuff, it just gets drowned. You know, somebody sees it and they're like, oh, well, that looks cool. Um, but we are trying, and, and that's also what I'm trying to do with the uh, decoding Dakar is that, you know, we want to build a online resource so that if somebody decides that this is what I want to do, that they can go and they can use that online resource and actually have a step-by-step -step plan of how to do it. And there's so many, there's a, a chasing waypoints. Uh, Victor does a great job at it and uh, about exposing people to, to rally. Um, but you have to look for it. You have to decide, I want to do it. You know, uh, and, and a lot of the times you don't even know about the guys. Like there's a guy, I think he's from Minnesota, West Car or Western Car. He just finished Dakar. And I'm like, who's this guy? I've never heard about him. And he did Dakar. Like we should know who this guy is. <laughs> you know, so even within the community, it's very, it's very, um, quiet not quiet but you have to you have to actively pursue it as you said right um i i you mentioned a car that car i've been mm -hmm. i've been uh i've been scolded online for saying it incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, I still don't know what it is i mean everybody's got their own uh, like in the old days it used to be dakar and now it's dakar so it's like yeah it was one of my buddies uh we were looking at the comments on one of my videos and people were were scolding me online in the comments and <laughs> we replied with the idea i wonder what the africans call it because they would have the true pronunciation of what that word mean or how it's said i guess so in my days it was dakar you know, Dakar. and it's still uh, yeah. The city is Dakar, so you go. I to think Dakar, I say Dakar, but... and and people get upset. <laughs> um, so so let's let's talk about that because um, that race. Can you put that into context for me and whoever's watching? Mm -hmm. What does that race mean? Uh, like I get the sense that it's the Everest of rally racing. Hundred percent. It then, is. Yeah. No. It is. It is. I think it's almost the K2 of rally racing if we, <laughs> we can go there. Um, and it's just, it's the Olympic Games. It is the absolute top level of racing that exists in the universe. And it is that thing where you will face every demon that you've ever had in your life over the course of two weeks. Um, there exists no such other challenge currently on the planet. So to put it into perspective, you know, it's two weeks of racing with one race day in between and thousands and thousands of miles. You know, in the old days, I think it used to be like 12,000 kilometers. I think this year it was around about 8,000 kilometers of racing where you are on the motorcycle all day, every day. And, you know, for anybody that's tried it, I mean, just go out for five days in a row and ride a bike, <laughs> you know, it, it gets to you. Um, so the Dakar has been since 1979, the, the ultimate motorcycle challenge in the world. Um, and it's the this, this test of absolute metal and durability and grit and just everything that makes us bikers. It tests that. And then you throw that in the fact that you can do absolutely everything right. And then you get to the idea that actually there's a hell of a lot, lot of luck involved as well. And I think that's where the mystique comes in. You know, you could do the best job you possibly can. Um, I know Ross Branch, um, I wouldn't say well, but, you know, we've, we've, we're friends. And, you know, Mason Klein, same story. Um, Americans might know him a bit better. Um, Ricky Brabeck, all of the big names. You can, a lot of them, you know, in order to finish in a podium in Dakar, most of them go through three or four iterations of Dakar where they don't even complete the race because everything has to fall in place perfectly. And even then, 
you know it it's it's a it's a gamble so i think it's the mixture of ultimate skill and endure, endurance and grit versus the cards need to be dealt right as well um yes of carl mccoy um american uh, who's now been uh, nicknamed the real mccoy if carl is listening that's a another friend of mine from south africa just uh, finished malamoto with him carl has been to dakar three times and he finished this year malamoto one of the toughest years on record but it took three tries um and he's a very accomplished rider uh last year or 2022 tw no start of 23 five americans tried to complete dakar to be the first malamoto guys to do it only one succeeded mohar and all of these guys are at the top of their game you know it's not you're not going to teach them anything about motorcycling um so it's it's the it's that ultimate test of of grit metal and durability endurance and will you know you have to have the will i mean, there's guys that there's so many stories of of guys that just go above and beyond what's possible and then kind of face those demons and finish so that's it you know you want to put yourself against that and see if you come out the other side you know you want to see if you break down so, so to talk about that demographic again, that may be interested in this, what, let's talk about costs just because, mm -hmm. you know, cost is important. People are always curious about money and mm -hmm. maybe let's talk about it in three phases. So phase one being, I want to dip my toe in and go on a rally uh, camp or mm -hmm. some sort of a small rally thing. And let's just talk North America, just because this is probably going to be mostly a North American audience. Um, maybe phase one, talk about the cost of maybe trying, trying a camp, maybe talk about the cost of say, attending the Baja rally, which, you know, is mm -hmm. relatively new on the scene, but it's growing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, exponentially. Uh, so that kind of a cost for, for someone to uh, compete or participate. And then mm -hmm. let's talk about Dakar itself. Okay. Yeah, cool. I love it. So I think to start off with, you know, your, your bare cost, your bare basics is that you need a motorcycle that can do, let's say, 200 in an ideal world, 250 kilometers fuel range, right? And that's, I mean, that's a whole different story where the coves, coves are going to really make a dent in the market because traditionally I had to buy a bike uh, and then I had to kitted out for rally now that kitting out for rally would have costed you thousands of dollars because it used to be you need to get a, a tank an oversized tank you need to work on the suspension because you put a tower in the front because you need a tower to house all of your navigation equipment where things have changed and improved in leaps and bounds is that with modern technology just to start and to try it out you don't need all of the stuff in the front anymore it's still it's nice it's nice to have a tower and also um matthew blade at rms uh, rally motor shop designed a, a revolutionary tower called the sonora tower which is super lightweight um but you know we've gone from essentially needing a laundry list of gear to simply needing a bike that can go uh, 150 to 200 kilometers on a tank and a some kind of digital android device you know that could be a cheap samsung tablet or it can be an advanced navigation tablet but you could most people have an old phone or an old tablet lying around you know you slap a ram out onto the bike and you put it on there and, and i have to emphasize this is not ideal racing scenario this is how to get into it right but so in short let's say you have a bike you have a 450 a 500 even a 350 i mean i've had my ass kicked by 350s in rallies a lot so you have a 350 to a 500 sitting at home you've always wanted to try it you get yourself a bigger tank if you don't already have one and you get yourself a tablet you're set to go right so most people for, for them let's say if most people that would cost a few hundred dollars at most now you have this you start now okay where do i go 
uh, you kind of you can contact me or you can get involved in the community but there are loads of outrights um you know there's guys in california that do outrights so there's a lot of stuff that you can just try for free that's not going to cost you any money um, a great example is socal uh, right now that will be in uh march if you get yourself to the socal desert you know, there's no cost involved in doing the event. You just go and ride it uh, because Dan is so passionate about it. You know, they put in hours and hours of work. So, you know, it's going to be your fuel and your time, basically. That's for the bare bones get to learn how events work. There are quite a few free events like that. Um, if we step up and we say we do a rally camp, you know, I am extremely passionate about what getting people in it. If I could do it for free, I would do it tomorrow. But the, the cost involved in actually getting a roadbook out is, is quite, there's a lot of time and effort. You know, you have to fly to a place, you have to lay out a route and all of that. So we try and keep the rally camps at bare bones costs, but you're looking at an entry fee of anything between 300 and $600, um, depending on where it is and what we do but that's a that's less than a thousand dollars you're going to get away for for an event like that and you will most probably come away from the event hooked on rally and at least know the basics of navigation so that if you see a dakar roadbook you'd be like oh i know what that is and i know what that means and i i understand the concept of navigation um if you then go into the costs of a rally let's use the baja rally as an example um, the bar rally uh, in its current iteration has been going on for 10 years already it's been growing substantially and you're looking at entry fee there of say between three thousand and three thousand six hundred dollars a lot of people are like well that's crazy you know that's so much money um, rallies are expensive and you know I have never met a person that was at a race that's never been there and complained about the cost of entry after they've seen what goes into it because you know to give you an example if you have a crash you know we have a helicopter at your side within minutes to pick you up you know that you don't pay for that, that that's part of your entry um, so the in short without talking about it for hours the reason entry fees to rallies are expensive is because of the safety aspect um, we want to be able to guarantee the absolute highest level of safety and because rallies are on the outskirts of civilization in deserts and in areas where it's inaccessible it makes it inherently expensive but when you're at the race you understand why uh, when you're enjoying the food in the middle of nowhere, you understand why. So, you know, you, you, I would say if you were to go with a supported package to Baja, so in other words, you rent a bike down there, let's call it a fly and ride option, you're probably looking at $7,000 um, all in. If you take your own bike, you have the entry, but then you have to contend with the fact that you have to get down to Catavina, you have to have your own support, you have to do all of that. But let's say realistically, a local US rally or, or North American rally um, is going to cost you a maximum or around $7,000. You know, there's the Kota rally uh, that has quite a, a low entry fee. I think it's $1,000, $1,500 because it's a slower race it's a more technical race so you have and, and you're not out in the middle of the mexican desert so your overarching costs is much cheaper um further down in mexico you have the coast to coast rally which is happening in february it is an amazing race i've done it uh, last year um the sonora rally uh the, their entry is going to be about the same you know about the three thousand dollar mark um so I would say to enter a semi-professional rally, you're looking at about three thousand dollars all in. If you if you're honest with yourself, if you go and count all the costs, you're going to turn around at seven thousand dollars or around there. Um, 
then if we step up to the big ones and that's uh, part of my kind of mission with decoding dakar this year is to provide full transparency to the community to say okay if you are truly serious about doing an international event like dakar or like Abu Dhabi or like rally de maroc here's all of the costs not the cost that i want it to be <laughs> but what it actually costs me you know and it's it's scary i mean i literally i just before we got on the call i had to pay for my fim license um so to keep compete internationally you need a, a um, international motorcycle racing license um so to count just to start there i have my mim ama membership which is 50 dollars for the year i had to do a physical at a doctor that was 120 dollars because it has to be a specific race physical and then the uh, the one event license for the fim is 500 dollars. so you know just to get to enter i have to put down 620 dollars um then uh you're looking at stuff like air vests and gear and that you know that runs into the thousands but if we get down to if we have to round figure dakar we're talking about a hundred thousand dollars um that's the we, what that's currency the are we talking when you say a hundred thousand us talking, us dollars right. we're talking and you know we have this discussion endlessly there, there are cheaper ways of doing it without a doubt the problem is you're going to maybe do it for eighty thousand dollars but you're you're going to more than half your chance of success at finishing so by the time that you spend eighty thousand dollars you know twenty thousand dollars isn't that much compared to your chances of finishing um and a great example is malamota right if i take my own bike or buy my own bike for Dakar and I enter Malamoto, my costs are my bike, my freight to get it there, um, my entry fee uh, and a few other things. And it will probably come to $80,000 if I, if I do it and on an absolute shoestring. At the same time, you know, not just, not just theory data shows me that you know i have a very very small chance of succeeding especially if it's my first deck or doing malamoto and sorry for the guys that that is not aware of what malamoto means so in the rally world the golden standard um is malamoto and malamoto means basically trunk or mala means trunk in french and moto means motorbike right so um, in the old days, you used to get one trunk that you could put on a truck, and that was it. So the class of Malamoto or Ironman developed in, in Dakar as no assistance or no support. So it is the guy that shows up with the bare minimum, and he does it in the old spirit of Dakar, where he's not allowed outside assistance except from other malamoto competitors so the malamoto race within any rally is a race within the rally um, where they are kind of the elite guys you know they have to manage their own time they have to manage their own bikes they have to work on their own bikes they have to pitch their own teams they have no support doing it absolutely alone um, so there's cheaper ways to do it but if we have to say realistically dakar is going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars and you know people are like you that's crazy how can you spend that amount of money on the race you know it and it i i guess that you know dreams and adventures like that is never something that you can justify because it's not about the money it's about something that you achieve that that transcends mere money value because realistically you can't put a money value to it you know and it's something that you know so many people have warned me about because i've done I, i've researched dakar my whole life it's been my driving force for many years and now that i'm like okay i'm actually going you know it's like people's like do not get caught up in the thing where it becomes so consuming that it consumes your life you know and it's something that i've worked on 
to kind of be emotionally strong and trained in compartmentalizing because i know people that you know has lost their families their wives or you know that has gone bankrupt um because of this all consuming fire to do it so you know th there is no rational or rational thought you you can't rationalize spending a hundred thousand dollars on a race um and for that reason i i decided to turn it into a community project rather than saying i am willem is going to dakar it, th that's not true like i am trying to reach dakar um and i'm trying to do it in in a way that would benefit the motorcycle community as a whole um so that we can help other people get there in a way that's easier than it is for us right now because right now it's damn difficult <laughs> it's it's a it's a challenge and a lot of the times that's the thing getting to the start line is way harder than actually doing the race so it's a whole journey but to answer your question we're ranging from free if you have the motorbike to a hundred thousand that's the spread <laughs> that, that doesn't really narrow it down much <laughs> So we've talked about the demographics, so people who are interested in this um, pursuing rally. Uh, we've talked about money and, uh, you know, big numbers, potentially big mm -hmm. numbers. Um, and then you've mentioned safety many times, uh, you mm -hmm. know, cost and safety all goes together. Mm -hmm. uh, in the medical community, they have this saying that small aircraft are called doctor killers because mm -hmm. the physicians can afford the aircraft but they don't they, they may not necessarily have the experience to be sitting in the seat and mm -hmm. it often results in tragic consequences so that mm -hmm. that's the I, i've heard of that for a long time and now that i get to have you sitting with me there i, I assume that this phenomenon must exist in the rally mm -hmm. world where there's people who have the, the financial capability of making these dreams happen, but may not have the, they may not have the chops to be in the seat that they're in. It, mm -hmm. Does this happen in the rally world? I, well, first off, I love the, 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 the plane analogy because I, a while ago, I read a book about small plane crashes and, you know, the leading cause was the idea that, you know, wasn't necessarily doctors, but that people, it's CEOs and people that used to give orders their whole life and that's always in control. And, you know, those are the boys that always end up crashing because they don't respect the fundamentals of flying. So it's a, it's a really, really cool analogy. Honestly, I, I don't know if that, if, if that translates a hundred percent to rally. Um, and there's several reasons why I think number one, to be a rally rider, you have, you're a certain personality type. And a lot of the times you arrive at rally, at least at that level of racing through a series of events. And it's almost impossible. And, and that's a big part of, of decoding Dakar this year to just sign up for Dakar. Um, you can, but you know, it's a, it's almost impossible because the ASO, which is the company that runs Dakar, they also own, it's the biggest sporting company in the world. They own Le Mans, they own um, the uh, Tour de France and all of that. They actually take a lot of care. I just finished an interview with, uh, with their kind of board of people that choose who come. Um, to avoid Dakar becoming an Everest, which is exactly what you've just described now, that people with enough money can go and do it. And they do that specifically for Dakar, but I'll get to other races now, that they build in a point system and a, a system that, that it's a very harsh, like right now, even with all of my experience today, I do not qualify to go to Dakar 2025. I actually now have to go and do another race um, in February in order to apply. And it's one of those things where they like, we want to make sure that people that enter this race are bon bona fide motorcycle races or rally races, because otherwise, you know, we're going to get the bottlenecks that you see on the Hillary step in, in Everest. Um, so, but that's a 
that becomes we maybe we can have a separate episode of that because that's an hour discussion because what that does is it cuts out true motorcyclists it cuts out the idea of adventure and it forms an elitist group of people so there's a very very interesting debate to be had between qualification and allowing people to face up to the challenge by their own means and, and we can get into that separately but it's a it's a good debate um so that's for dakar in general like i say you you're going to be a certain person to do to do rally and to like rally um to me the the risk that i see because it, it rally inherently to me is way safer than any other motorcycle sport the reason for that is because at any given time you're being tracked um and your race is being managed by us the, the organization but through the roadbook right so if there's a danger comes up i can warn you about the danger through the roadbook um so a simple example is we're going on a two track road somewhere where you have an fz which is basically no speed limit and you can you your the aim is to go as fast as you possibly can um under normal circumstances with a gps or if you were riding if there were a blind rise with a wash on the other side you wouldn't know about it so you would take the rise and the basically crash because you've been going too fast the road book warns you of that um, and it enables you to push the limits and go faster safely because uh, if it's a triple caution so in a road book you will get different instructions cautions are uh, br broken up in three sections caution one caution two and caution three uh, for a biker a caution one you don't really worry about it too much it's more about pay attention there's something there so that would be a small wash or a rock in the road or something like that uh, double caution is be like there is a good probability that you could fall here if you are not paying attention so that would be a deeper rut or a wash or maybe the road is covered in rocks so i want to i'll probably tap down a little bit if i see a, a double caution if we talk about a triple caution that's going to be a crash that if you crash here you're going to die and therefore you need to slow down so on that when you have in a rally you have what we call a rally computer um in north america a guy called mike johnson developed something called rally comp which is revolutionary and it really helps furthering the sport so in america you guys have the privilege to use rally comp which is amazing um so you have either rally comp or you have stella which if any of the listeners that's done the baja 1000 will understand what stella is and then you have ertf which is the french system and those are the kind of three rally safety management systems now all three of these systems would be a device that you attach to your bike while you're competing in the race so that the organization can make sure that you are following the rules and so that they can warn you and what will happen on a triple caution is a triple caution would be classed as a waypoint and it will actually open up and give you an arrow at a designated um, uh, radius and it'll start beeping at you and it'll warn you that there is a danger coming up so from a riding dash racing perspective in my opinion there is no safer type of racing than rally racing a guy that finds himself under kind of qualified to do that you know you i always use this term that you have to ride the terrain and not the road book right you are in charge of your own destiny so it's one of those things where there's not that many as with flying that many outside factors that's out of your control in fact in the rally world it's a highly controlled scenario for you don't realize it you don't know it in the moment because you don't know where you're going but it's a it's a it's an environment where you can accept risk because the risk is controlled um so in that terms it's super safe where i think it the bar gets raised and where it gets difficult is that if you swim in the ocean every day 
for the rest of your life, the chance of getting bitten by a shark goes up exponentially. So the rally riders spend more time on a bike than any other type of motorcyclist. And that brings with it inherent risks. And that's another debate that would be a, a great program is that, you know, I've now come to the point. So before this, or I still, I guess I still am, but my other professional life is a professional tree climber as an arborist. And, you know, at some point, your life insurance goes through the roof because they've made a calculation which is similar to fighter pilots that if you do this job of swinging around trees with ropes and chainsaws for long enough, even without a serious accident, at a certain age or at a certain point, the risk becomes intolerable because it's just a matter of time before you have a bad accident. And therefore, we are not going to be able to insure you. And that has raised a very interesting conundrum for me because I love motorcycles and I love racing. But now I've seen that every time I swing my leg over a saddle, I assume a certain amount of risk, whether it's, it doesn't matter what type of riding it is. So now I used to be like ride as much as I can, whenever I can. And now I'm like, I actually think about the type and quality of riding I want to do more because I realize that every time I swing my leg over that saddle is an hour closer to an inevitable accident at some point. Because we, but that's the, that's the, that's just being accidents, you know, and those things happen. Um, so I think, sorry, it's a very long answer, but coming back to it, I, I think it's more a question of in, in ever, inevitability versus risk versus not being qualified to ride a bike properly because the only way you get qualified is by riding so i would encourage anybody even if they don't have a lot of experience as long as they are prepared for the challenge to do the rally because you know th that's the other thing about rallies everybody focuses on you know the speed and the top guys and stuff you know, the, the fun of a rally is that you put yourself against the guys that that are around you. So, you know, the spread on every given day is up to six hours, you know, easily between the top and the back. But you still get to rub shoulders with the top guys. You still, you, you're still part of the same club. Nobody looks at your time like, oh, you came dead last. That, that's not an issue. The, the issue is you navigated and you succeeded in finishing the stage. That's all that matters. So you adjust your risk profile to your skill level. Um, and that's been an interesting journey for me. You know, I've always been a mid-pack rider and, and I, I see myself as a mid-pack rider still because that's my skill level. But just because I do it more, I end up consistently end up closer to the front than I used to. But that's only, I, I'm not accepting more risk. It's just because I'm doing it more and more. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that I think is the answer. Sorry, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have another question uh, pertaining to that very thing. Uh, I'm, I, I'll ask you two more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First one is, uh, what to succeed in rally, I know, I know you need a lot of uh, skills, like a wide variety of skills, but what, what would you say the most important skill would be to, to, to do well in rally? And, and well is okay. ambiguous. Well is, yes. well is completing it, feeling mm -hmm. good about it, satisfied without getting injured. Exactly. A hundred percent. Look, to, to put it in perspective, you know, the, the, the rate of which people, the attrition rate of rallies are, is huge, you know, like on any given day, you know, 30% of the field's not going to finish. So to me, success doesn't matter. The, I, in a rally, it's not about time for me personally. It's about finishing every stage. That would be step one. Step two would be finishing every stage without penalties. And then you start worrying about time. So in order to succeed for me means to finish a stage 
with zero penalties, which is extremely difficult to do once you start getting into it. Um, and I would say the most important skill in that is determination. And, you know, in Afrikaans, we have a very, very cool word called fussbait. And fussbait is basically bite on or keep on biting because, you know, when you are, if you're going to be prepared for pain, in the old days they used to put something in your mouth and, you know, before they inflict the pain on you, they, they tell you bite fuss. So, you know, a bite down because the pain's coming. So you can't really translate it to English other than grit, you know. But if you have that determination and that will to succeed, you know, that is, without that, you, you shouldn't even start really. Like if it's a little bit of a, is it, what's the English word if you like to inflict pain on yourself? Is it, um, there's a word for it um, in English. Um, sure. P, I'll, I'll remember the name, but there's a name that like, if you, if you like pain, there's a name for it. Um, so, you know, you have to, you have to be prepared to, to take a bit of pain. Uh, but if you have that, if you like a challenge and if you like to push yourself, grit and determination is the only thing. As long as you can keep on moving forward, you know, with a broken mic, with a sore shoulder or with a broken fingernails, whatever, you know, that's, that's the number one kind of aspect of, or not aspect, trait you have to have. If you have that, you will succeed in rally because everything else comes afterwards. Navigation, and you know, this we have a rule like you know, you everybody help, we help each other. That's the beauty of the rally world, right? You know, if you show that you are into this and you want to do it, people will always help you. I mean, I can write a book about the the, the stories of help in rally. The, the, the so you know, the difference is. You help a guy that wants to be helped. So, uh, to put it in perspective, if if we're if I'm racing, and uh, I I get to a guy and I, that I didn't make this up. Somebody taught me this. I I can't remember who, but it's like you know, if you get to a guy that's standing next to the road, next to his bike, just looking at the bike and like wah wah wah, you know, you don't stop because you're on the clock. If you get to a guy that's taken the bike apart and he's got his tools out and he's busy working on the bike, you'd stop and you help him or you ask him if you can help him because he's in the race with you. But it shows the intent that he wants to fix the problem. Whereas the guy that's just standing there and, and you see it in Dakar, like this year for the guys that follow Dakar, many factory riders, you know, the scene that we saw of the factory rider is a broken bike and the guy is on his sat phone with the team. Whereas if we take rising superstar Mason Klein, you know, he's busy taking the freaking bike apart in the desert, you know, changing parts and making it work. Um, so, you know, if you have that, if you have that will, the rally community and the guys in the race, like ha that happened with, with Mason, will help you. Um, and that's why it's such an awesome community and awesome sport. Um, the rest comes later, you know, the navigation, the riding skill. I mean, you should have a basic riding skill. It's not, it's not an easy type of riding, but you don't, ha you don't have to, I, I don't want people to be scared of getting into the sport. It's more about make sure you have the determination to never quit. If you're not going to quit, you're going to do well in it. Uh, so I got one last question for you. Uh, this has this hasn't got to do with rally. Weirdly, you're from South Africa, and myself as a North American probably share with lots of other riders the idea that we would like to ride in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, you know what part of Africa? Who knows whether it's the north or the south, mm -hmm. but. Riding in Africa, riding a motorcycle in Africa comes with a whole bunch of baggage. And, and that baggage is individual. Like, you know, it depends what newscast I saw or what mm -hmm. revolution or political Very instability, much. what book I read. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's always this curtain of fear uh, surrounding the continent of Africa. And mm -hmm. because you're from there and you've spent extensive amounts of time in Africa, 
Tell me what the reality of that is. Okay. I'm I'm going to formally request that we do a separate episode because I'm super, super passionate about exactly this. And I will do my best to like give you a 30,000 foot view. But you know, it's, it's, it is so complex that you cannot summarize it. But in short, to answer your question, I think many of your viewers and listeners would be familiar with the same concept in Mexico, right? Where people's like, oh, don't go down to Mexico. You're going to get killed in Mexico or it's dangerous. And you speak to people that ride motorcycles in Mexico often and they're like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, just, just, there's no, it's not true. So um, let's not, uh, like, there's no way that I can dance or beat around the bush that South Africa as a country is extremely dangerous, right? If you look at it, on paper in in the statistics, same as Mexico. Um, I think the biggest thing in South Africa is that those statistics, very similar to Mexico, is very much skewed because of uh, specific geographical anomalies and locations, right? So a lot of the crime happens in very specific areas and the crime that happens there is so high and so much that it skews the statistics you know you if you land in cape town south africa you know you are it's as good as landing in europe the difference is that in america we don't live or see class difference it's not so much in your face in africa the have and the have not is so much in your face that if you land in Cape Town International Airport, you land next to a squatter camp. You land next to a, a place where people live in abject poverty and it looks like something out of a District 9 movie, you know. And But those people are people. They live there every single day. It's not that you have to fear for your life because there is a bunch of poor people around you. Um, and most of those people are just trying to make an honest living. So Cape Town specifically, first world, it's as good as landing in Europe. Johannesburg, Gauteng, different area, you know, they, if you go out of your hotel, you take your life in your hands. So it, it and but it's exactly the same in Mexico. So there's you know there's different things to be aware of, but in general, motorcycle riding in South Africa and Namibia um, is some of the best riding that you will do in your entire life. And the reason being is because of the people. You know we are extremely extremely friendly, open people, and I've tried to dig into that as far as if if it's our roots if it's our, it's definitely our culture but i don't know where it comes from but it, it it's this thing that as a south african i feel a moral responsibility to show anybody that's not from there the best possible time right if you if i meet you in south africa on the road as a stranger and you are not south african i want you to leave that interaction thinking that, wow, this was a great interaction. And most South Africans are like that. It's just part of our culture. And you people will bend backwards to help you. You know, if you are on an adventure ride in South Africa and you have an issue with your bike, you know, um, somebody will stop next to you and they'll be like, can I help you? And if they can't, they'll phone a buddy that's got a bike and they'll figure it out. And it's just warm friendly people so that's the one aspect the other aspect is that you know you can do a lifetime's worth of riding in five or six days because the u.s is massive right i mean i i still kind of my mind gets boggled about how big north america is but coming from south africa we have different biomes kind of concentrated in a very small area. So the country is made out of three huge plateaus and you have the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean on two sides. So I can go in one day from riding in forests, in indigenous forests, to riding in mountains, to riding in a desert, all in one day. And 
all spectacularly beautiful things. So those are the pros, I would say, is, is the people and the quality of the riding. Um, the cons are that in big cities, you know, you, there are risk involved as, as far as crime is concerned. If you are not, if you don't use common sense, if you use common sense, you'll be fine. But also going out into the countryside of South Africa is, is safe, you know, or Namibia. Um, and another con which a lot of people don't understand and they have a misconception of, and, and it's something I haven't understood until I spent more time in America, was that all land in South Africa and Namibia are, is owned by someone or something. Um, we do not have these vast tracts of lands that you guys have BLM and government land. And, you know, it's I, I see it as some a huge privilege for North Americans, you know, both in Canada and in America. And I feel like it's something they have to fight for because nowhere on the planet do you have more free recreational space than in North America. And it's it's something to cherish and to protect because where I come from, you know, yes, it's Africa, and yes, there's land everywhere, but every piece of land is either owned by the government or by a national park or by an individual. And you can't just go into a gate and go and ride on somebody's land. Um, so that's one of the cons, although there is enough space and roads and places that are open to the public that as a visitor to South Africa, that will not become an issue. Of somebody like me that does thousands of kilometers, that becomes an issue because you know I've been on every road. Now I have to obtain permission from the landowner, and that becomes tricky. But as somebody that visits South Africa, um, you you they want in, uh, that wants to ride a bike, uh, that won't be a problem. And you know, on that kind of in that vein, um, we do. I mean, I'm not a tour operator. But um, I am super passionate about showing people things they haven't seen on motorbikes, right? So we do do like tours uh, in the sense of it's not a traditional tour. I can't cater like, let's call it biker tours. <laughs> like, you know, you're going to get there, you're going to get on a bike. We just, It's not a tour. It's a ride along. Let's put it that way. You know, I'm not going to, I can't wait on you and hear about your dietary restrictions. It's like... I'm going to go for a ride and if you want to join in, you know, join in. Um, but we do that. I do that in South Africa and also in Namibia um, with a, a lot of times I roll it into the road book camp. So if I'm going to go to South Africa anyway to do a road book camp, I go a week earlier and, and we, cause you're flying anyway, um, you're paying for the ticket. You might as well ride more. So a lot of the times I'd combine a road book camp with a tour uh, or a ride. And, you know, those rides are, it's always so much fun because it's always like-minded people. I find that if you're going to ride a motorcycle in a different country, you're going to be a good guy. <laughs> Most of the time you get along. So, right. and then we, we go on stuff that you won't normally see, uh, you know, through, it's not what you would do if you go and rent a bike in Cape Town. We go and show, i show you the, or the real of the beaten track stuff, the type of stuff I like that you can't find in a guidebook kind of thing. Right. And uh, before we go, um, where can people find you if they want to support your journey? You're, you're attempting to race Dakar in 25, which is a mm -hmm. monumental um, attempt. I mean, I know it's very mm -hmm. difficult. Where, where can people go to find you, your social media? How can they support you? So for me currently, um, decoding Dakar is kind of the hanger that I put or the stake I put in the ground. Um, and I'm sure if they Google decoding Dakar, it will come up. But if it doesn't, you know, Willem Avenant Racing, I'm sure we can link it in the description. I'll send you something. Um, Willem Avenant Racing is pretty much the handle for everything. Um, they'll find the website and they'll find all my social media. Um, and decoding Dakar is is a year of committing to the motorcycling community, saying that you know I've actually for this year taken off. I don't have a job as such. I'm committing the year to training and fundraising and getting to Dakar. 
and uh, to building a blueprint for future Dakar hopefuls that want to reach Dakar so that they don't have to struggle as much as we are currently are doing. So they'll find me at uh, willemavenantracing.com or under the hashtag decoding Dakar. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. And well, maybe thank you. We'll this is fun. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah look, I can I can talk about the bikes all day. I, I definitely uh, the concept of traveling in different countries and not being scared. I think is a, is something that I'm super passionate about, and that'd be a great great uh, program. Well, Willem, thank you so much, and I look forward to speaking with you in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for everything you guys do for the motorcycle community. Thanks for always bringing us super interesting stuff. I love watching your videos because I always know that if there's something there, it's going to be something cool and worth watching. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. You too. Cool, man. That's good. Cool. Well, listen, thank you so, so much. That was, I mean, I can't remember when last had so much fun. That was good.